hello everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, I am Michael Dodora Jr., the Executive Director of the Center for Inquiry in New York City. Um, the reason we are here today is that 201 years ago, actually yesterday, the world welcomed Charles Darwin. Darwin, as I'm assuming almost everyone in this room knows, uh, grew up to become the famed naturalist who discovered that all species of life have descended over time from common ancestors and proposed the scientific theory that this branching pattern of evolution, or as Richard Dawkins would call it, evolution, is the result of a process called natural selection. Darwin's theory, contained in The Origin of Species, or On the Origin of Species, was penned in a style of writing accessible to both scientists and the general public, generating much discussion in scientific, religious, and philosophical circles. In its current form, after about a century and a half of scientific advancement, the theory of evolution is the unifying theory of the life sciences, explaining the diversity of life on Earth. Because of its explanatory power and its implications for the nature of mankind and all life on Earth, the theory of evolution remains one of the most talked about scientific theories out there. Unfortunately, not all talk of the theory is to the public's benefit. Uh, of course, a talk like today is to the public benefit, but there are many people uh, in the American population who doubt the validity of this theory. Indeed, about 40% of the country's population, if you trust the polls. Today's event, featuring prominent paleoanthropologist Ian Tattersall, who will discuss Darwin and human evolution, is the result of a partnership between two organizations, the Center for Inquiry and the New York City Skeptics, and a student group here, Free Inquiry and Secular Humanism at Hunter College, all of which very much like Darwin, understand the importance and the truth of the theory itself and the need for the general public to fully comprehend it. The organizations involved, the Center for Inquiry being the first one, um, the Center for Inquiry is a think tank uh, both working at the national and international uh, level but also at the local level with the local branch in New York City uh, that promotes uh, science, reason, and secular values. The New York City Skeptics is a local all-volunteer organization that promotes science education, scientific inquiry, and scientific knowledge, and critical thinking. The student group here, Free Inquiry and Secular uh, Humanism at Hunter College, uh, is a pretty obvious one. They promote free inquiry and secular humanism at Hunter College. Uh, but they are a new group on campus this year, and this is their first event, um, and I think a pretty well-attended event um, that shows the power of uh, these ideas on a college campus. Um, if you want to know more uh, about any of these groups, of course you can, uh, after the event, find the information table on the back. Uh, there is one other organization that's also relatively new that is involved in today's event, that is Reasonable New York, which is a new coalition of rationalist groups in New York City, uh, of which the, the Skeptics and the Center for Inquiry in New York City are both a part of. Uh, you can go to reasonablenewyork.com to find out more about those. So before I introduce Massimo Pugliucci, let me just lay a, a few of the ground rules today. Uh, Dr. Tattersall will speak for about 45 minutes, after which uh, Mr. Pigliucci will sit down with him for a conversation. Uh, some of the questions asked of uh, Dr. Tattersall at this point will come from the audience, that is you. Uh, if you didn't get a blank card while you were walking uh, in as, as you were giving your name, there are some volunteers walking around right now handing them out, so if you could just raise your hand if you don't have one, um, we will come and get one to you. If you're going to ask a question, just keep in mind that you should probably print it legibly, that is so we can read it. And include your name first, uh, and if you want your last name, we don't need emails or phone numbers or anything like that, though. And then at the end of the event, toward the end of Dr. Tattersall's Tedders talk, we will come around and collect the cards and hand them to Professor Pagliucci, who will have a conversation with Dr. Tattersall. Um, just another quick note before I introduce uh, Massimo, two quick notes, I'm sorry. There is a bookseller here that will be selling copies of Dr. Tedersall's book and Massimo Pagliucci's books. Um, they will be in the back of the room at the end of the event, and both men will stick around for a book signing. Also, after the event at 6 p.m., there is a meetup for skeptics, scientifically inclined people at Vero Uptown on 71st and 2nd. Uh, Daniel, with uh, he's raising his hand right there, is the guy to talk to. Ev everyone just look at you, Daniel. Uh, he's the, the fellow to talk to if you're interested in going to that. Now to the event. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing my good friend Massimo Pagliucci, who is a professor of philosophy and chair of the philosophy department at CUNY Lehman College. 
His research is concerned with the philosophy of science, the relationship between science and religion, and the relationship between science and philosophy. He received a doctorate in genetics from the University of Ferrara in Italy, a PhD in botany from the University of Connecticut, and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Tennessee. He's published over 100 technical papers, several books, has columns in the magazines Philosophy Now and Skeptical Inquirer, and pens the Rationally Speaking blog. His upcoming book will be released in the spring and is unfortunately not here today, but is available for pre-order on Amazon, I think. It is entitled Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk. Without further ado, I give you Massimo Pagliucci. Thank you, Michael, for the nice introduction, and thanks, everybody, for coming here today. I will be very brief. I'll just introduce Dr. Tarasol, and then we'll get to the, to the actual program. As Michael has explained, uh, we'll have a first... Uh, Mike, how about this one? Thank you. All right. As Michael has explained, uh, this event will have two parts, essentially, the, the, the talk by Dr. Tarasol, and then we'll have sort of a conversation. We'll sit at those two chairs over there. I'll ask him questions about the talk or more general about um, evolutionary biology, and we will take your questions uh, through the cards. So um, Ian Tarasol is a curator in the anthropology section of the American Museum of Natural History here in, uh, in town. He has a PhD from Yale University, uh, which he got by doing studies on uh, subfossil lemurs in Madagascar. Uh, he is currently working on a multi-volume project to document the major fossils in the human fossil record, which is something, it's a, this, this magnus opus that has never been actually been done before. He is also continuing his independent inquiries into the nature and emergence of modern human cognition, uh, which has been one of his interests for several years. In uh, 2000, Dr. Tarasol won the W.W. W. Howells Prize of the American Anthropological Association uh, for his, one of his books, Becoming Human, Evolution and Human Uniqueness. Uh, his most recent book uh, with Rob DeSalle is Humans Origi Human Origins, What Bones and Genomes Tell Us About Ourselves, which is published by Texas A&M University Press. And uh, today, Dr. Tarasol will talk about Charles Darwin and the human fossil record. Ian? I have to check if I'm switched on. Am I? Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very nice uh, introduction, uh, Massimo. And um, it's a great pleasure and, uh, and a privilege, of course, to, be, uh, to have been asked to speak to you all uh, uh, today. Uh, we've all been worried uh, this year. Last year was, of course, the 200th anniversary of uh, Darwin's birth, and it was the 150th anniversary of the publication of his great book on the origin of species. And there was a huge amount of Darwiniana going on practically the whole year, because he was born in February, and the, uh, the book came out in, uh, in November. And there was an enormous number of events uh, in between. But it's really, really very gratifying to see that uh, uh, people aren't all burned out on Darwin uh, by any manner of uh, means, and that the interest is still at this very high level uh, this, uh, th this year too. And this is really, really, really important because, of course, the, the view of the world that Darwin introduced us to is really what underwrites our understanding of uh, all of uh, biology today. And that's also true... <coughs> for uh, paleoanthropology, which is my particular uh, specialty. I study uh, uh, fossil humans, the, uh, the story of uh, human evolution, and of course, we celebrate Charles Darwin as uh, perhaps the most significant early founder of our discipline too. But taking on the subject of uh, Charles Darwin and the, the human fossil record actually turns out to be a pretty tough kind of a proposition because actually the human fossil record was a subject on which Darwin himself was spectacularly unforthcoming. Now of course he was most famously reticent on uh, this matter of human evolution in his great book on the origin of species. In fact his only mention of uh, human origins in the entire uh, volume was this throwaway comment. 
light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. And of course, this has got to rank among the greatest uh, epic understatements uh, that were uh, ever made. And of course, it begged the question, what light? But in the event, Darwin proved oddly reluctant to uh, follow up on this question, except in the context of a very specific agenda that I'll mention in a moment. <clears throat> now, there were clearly multiple reasons for this neglect of a central issue that Darwin had apparently really intended to tackle before he was spurred at the last moment into rapidly writing the, uh, On the Origin of Species in 1858. And first and most famously among these, uh, these reasons for his reluctance were, of course, the intellectual and social milieu in which Darwin himself lived. Um, early Victorian England remained a sort of a straight-laced Anglican society whose upper classes well remembered events in France uh, not so very long before. And they really had very little taste for uh, radical ideas in any field. And in such an unreceptive uh, setting, the gentlemanly Darwin had very little relish for stirring things up with radical ideas about human emergence. But even despite his omission uh, from the pages of On the Origin of Species of the contentious issue uh, that human evolution certainly was, Darwin still saw his book condemned as an intellectual heresy and even as a recipe for the ruin of, uh, of established society. And as a result, a whole decade later, while he was contemplating the publication of The Descent of Man, the uh, book in which he finally forced himself to confront, in his own sort of uh, roundabout, indirect way, the implications of his theory for the origin of humankind, um, Darwin was still able to write to a colleague with enormous trepidation that when I publish my book, I can see that I shall meet with universal disapprobation, if not execration. And I've actually seen that word uh, rendered execution too, and uh, even that <laughs> would have been, uh, been um, very much in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, in character. Now, to be quite frank, given all these hesitations that he had, it's hardly evident exactly why Darwin felt so strongly impelled in 1871 to publish his book On the Descent of Man, or at least to give it the very provocative title that he did, and it's not actually a very, very descriptive title, accurately descriptive title, much more provocative than descriptive. Now, one, pol one um, possibility why he went ahead with his publication anyway is that he was simply dissatisfied with the accounts of human origins that had been offered during the 1860s by such fellow luminaries as Alfred Russell Wallace, who was the co-inventor of the notion of evolution by natural selection, and Ernst Haeckel, whose take on the matter uh, we see here, who was the foremost proponent of Darwinism on the, uh, on the European continent. But probably much more important than a dissatisfaction with uh, the work of others on this uh, subject was an agenda that has recently been the subject of a book by the Darwin historians James Moore and um, Adrian Desmond. And these two guys looked to Darwin's family and his educational background for an alternative motivation for reticence, or for, for going forward with this project of the descent of man. And for a start, they point out that Darwin came from a family of free thinkers. Darwin was the grandson both of the libertarian poet and physician Erasmus Darwin and of the Unitarian Josiah Wedgwood, who in 1787 had produced this famous Am I Not a Man and a Brother cameo that was going to become the emblem of the movement to abolish slavery. Darwin himself abhorred uh, slavery, and he was already a convinced abolitionist by the time he uh, set foot on the Beagle for his round-the-world voyage in 1831. And his subsequent experiences in Brazil 
where he witnessed hideous cruelties being inflicted on slaves, and in Argentina, where he saw Pampas Indians being slaughtered to make way for uh, Spanish ranchers, these experiences only confirmed him in his egalitarian beliefs. And what's more, this sort of practical and moral concern that he developed linked in with his very strong intellectual views on the unity of mankind, as opposed to the uh, separate creation of the races that was generally preached by the advocates of uh, slavery at the time. There was a very active debate between monogenism and polygenism, that is to say the separate or the single creation of uh, the, the human races. And Darwin was very clearly on the monogenist side. And of course in this matter, in this debate, there was clearly very little hope, if any, that science could ever be disentangled from politics and from cultural attitudes. And I think it was this above everything else that dissuaded Darwin from including any discussion, any specific discussion of uh, humans in the origin. Darwin hated controversy, and he knew that this was going to be a, a, a problem if ever he broached it directly. But by 1871, the world had evidently changed enough to allow Darwin to contemplate entering the fray despite all these misgivings that he had. And the descent of man, I think, can validly be seen as Darwin's personal contribution to the active monogenism versus polygenism debate that was going on, especially since apologists for slavery, since the publication of The Origin of Species, had begun to suggest that the various races of humankind were descended from separate species of apes. So he really felt an obligation, I think, to set the record straight. Now, nonetheless, Darwin did choose to title his book The Descent of Man. And descent is a word that he had for a long time used pretty much as an exact equivalent to the word ancestry. And given this equivalence, it seems at least a bit odd that in the entire two volumes of The Descent of Man, there's virtually no consideration of any fossils that might have given a historical embodiment to the notion of human ancestry. And it's particularly odd because even when Darwin was writing The Origin of Species in 1858 to 1859, a handful of antediluvian ancient human fossils was already known. Now the most uh, famous of these fossils, of course, was the Neanderthal skeleton that was discovered in 1856, and we see these bones here. Um, associated with the bones of mammal species known to be extinct, this specimen was destined in 1863 to become the type specimen of Homo neanderthalensis, an extinct cousin of our own species Homo sapiens. And Neanderthals are very distinctive indeed. And we now know that we probably last shared an ancestor with the Neanderthals well over uh, half a million years ago. <clears throat> now, of course, it's rather unlikely that the Neanderthal fossil came to Darwin's attention before uh, the description of it originally in German was uh, translated into English by the London anatomist George Busk in 1861. But Busk's translation was a decade old before the descent of man first appeared. And in the interim, in these intervening 10 years, the Neanderthal fossil had unleashed a huge debate that raged in the scientific establishment of uh, which uh, Darwin was so much a part. And this alone really makes it rather odd that in The Descent of Man, the detail-obsessed Darwin made only passing reference to the uh, Feldhofer fossil. And uh, this neglect is all the more remarkable in light of the fact that in 1863, that same George Busk had already described another individual, another Neanderthal individual of similarly distinctive appearance from the uh, British possession of Gibraltar. And that's what we see here. And indeed, I just learned that it's virtually, it's virtually a certain that Darwin had actually held this very fossil in his own hands. Because it's on record, 
that uh, Hugh Faulkner, the paleontologist Hugh Faulkner, uh, Faulkner had come by Darwin's sister-in-law's house in London with the specific aim of showing it to him. Yet, the only mention in all the many, many millions of words that Darwin wrote of this fossil is what you see here. He wrote this uh, a letter to Hooker the same day that he saw this fossil, and he said, Faulkner brought me the wonderful Gibraltar skull. So we know he thought it was wonderful, but we don't know what else he thought of it. Not a hint, not a hint of what he actually made of this specimen. And that was even in his private correspondence. It wasn't, you know, you can understand him not going public with it, but not saying more in private is kind of very odd because he had an opinion on everything. Anyway, taken together, the Neanderthal and the Gibraltar specimens had demonstrated pretty conclusively by the middle 1860s that these fossils, these two fossils, could not simply be written off as a pathological form of Homo sapiens, as some influential biologists had claimed. And at the very least, they represented a highly distinctive human variety that needed explanation of uh, some kind. And uh, they were very distinctive, as you can see from this uh, illustration showing a Neanderthal skull on your left and a modern human skull on your right. And you can see that these creatures uh, were very, very different uh, indeed. Uh, the, uh, the similarity, though, is that uh, the Neanderthal skull had evidently uh, contained a brain that was as large as the one that resides in our own heads today. So it's distinctive and, f and, uh, uh, and similar to humans at the same time. And however you looked at it, this was a very important fossil indeed. But the only reference that the highly erudite Darwin made to this specimen in The Descent of Man was that some skulls of very high in antiquity, such as the famous one of the Neanderthal, are well-developed and capacious. And that's it. In, I don't know, 1,500, 1,800 pages, however many, this is the only reference that we see. And it's hard not to conclude, I think, <coughs> that in limiting his reference to the Neanderthal fossil in this way, Darwin was grasping at the politically very congenial notion that the Neanderthal, ancient as it might have been, was simply a bizarre and primitive kind of uh, modern human. And Darwin evidently had no desire whatever to see Neanderthals as a distinct species, ancestral or otherwise. Indeed, only very indirectly in The Descent of Man did Darwin even hint that Homo sapiens itself might have had identifiable uh, extinct relatives. And all of this despite the fact that the entire origin of species had been suffused with the notion that having extinct relatives must be a general property of all living forms. Now, in his uh, introduction to The Descent of Man, Darwin partially excused himself for his neglect of human antiquity by deferring uh, to the work of others. But there were very likely some more specific keys as well to Darwin's uh, reluctance to embroil himself too closely in the actual tangible evidence for human ancientness and human ancestry. Uh, for example, the 1860s, which were the years leading up to the publication of The Descent of Man, were a period of rampant fraud and fakery in the antiquities business. And a business it certainly was. Antiquities were big in the middle 19th century. And by the time that Darwin published The Descent of Man, it was widely accepted uh, that at the very least, the human past far antedated the biblical accounts of it. It was clear that, that the human um, past went back into remote antiquity and an energetic search was on for evidence of that ancient past. Today, we honor the French antiquarian and customs uh, collector Jacques Boucher de Perte, whom we see here, as the first man to recognize the Ice Age stone hand axes found in the terraces of the Somme River in northern France as the products of truly ancient humans. 
And it was an extraordinary thing that he did to make this recognition. But in the 1840s and the 1850s, Boucher de Pet was widely ridiculed as the gullible victim of hoaxes. And indeed, it's very true that he was rather undiscriminating in what he was prepared to consider ancient. Many of his prize artifacts actually turned out to have been napped by his quarrymen, who were only too happy you know, to con their, uh, their boss out of a few francs whenever they could. So the hand axes we see in this uh, slide here are real, but there were a lot of uh, fakes around. And Boucher de Pet had in particular been embroiled in a very famous hoax involving a supposedly antediluvian human fossil. In early 1863, Boucher de Pet offered a reward of uh, 200 francs to any workman who could find fossil remains of the maker of his ancient stone tools. And on March 28th of the year, of that very same year, a supposedly ancient human jawbone indeed showed up, along with hand axes, at a site in northern France called moulin Quignon. And uh, here it is. Now, a, a scandal almost immediately blew up over the authenticity of this object and um, the stone tools that were supposedly uh, associated with it. And, of course, this was indeed a, a, a fake, and the ensuing scandal added up to the kind of unseemly squabble that Darwin most detested and always did his best to avoid. I'm sure that uh, Darwin really found this whole thing very distasteful indeed. Um, and what's more, there were similar and almost equally uh, embarrassing scandals actually a lot closer to home. In England, the so-called Prince of Counterfeiters was a guy called uh, Edward Simpson, alias Flint Jack, and here's Flint Jack. <laughs> now, during several years of assisting local physicians who uh, <coughs> dug for, uh, for antiquities in their spare time, Flint Jack taught himself the art of uh, stoneworking. And soon this gifted Flint Napper was producing supposedly Stone Age tools that would fool even the most expert eye. And he sold his forgeries to collectors and museums all over the country. And finally, he even brazenly peddled uh, them as his own work. And this was before the sheer quantity of the real thing actually put him out of business in the end. Here's a montage of Flynn Jack and some of his tools that he made. And you can see that he even shamelessly signed uh, one of them. Uh, <laughs> pretty good. Well, anyway, the point of all this is that I'm sure Darwin uh, found all of this fraud and scandal in the marketplace, in the antiquarian marketplace, very, very distasteful and uh, exactly the kind of thing that he wanted to avoid. But even so, you can't help asking why Darwin gave even the idea of an actual fossil ancestries for humans uh, such a wide berth in his great book on human descent, The Descent of Man. <coughs> now, of course, it's entirely plausible that Darwin simply felt that the safest route to take uh, with the subject was to limit himself to the comparative method, which meant that he could uncontroversially uh, contrast uh, humans uh, with apes and other primates and merely conjecture about hypothetical and thus uncontroversial uh, transitional forms. And indeed, it was a safe way to go. But it does seem to me that another contributing factor may well have been Darwin's remarkably suspicious attitude to the fossil record in general. Now, under the rubric of objections to the theory, Darwin devoted an entire chapter in his book on the origin of species to the imperfection of the geological record. And <coughs> here's a quote from that chapter. And he gave reason after reason, not only why the fossil record was not adequate, as indeed it wasn't uh, in those days, but why it could not uh, be, uh, be adequate. Now, Darwin's general weariness of the geological record may seem a bit odd in uh, somebody who considered himself first and foremost a, uh, a geologist. And it may seem even odder, maybe, uh, in somebody whose nascent ideas about the history of life had been so clearly nourished by the fossils that he himself had found uh, during his voyage around the world um, on the Beagle. But although his, 
His geological observations had been critical in making Darwin very acutely aware of the transitory nature of uh, everything he saw around him. He clearly felt uneasy about the fossil record as a sort of a record of specific events. And the upshot of this was that, <coughs> excuse me, although Darwin's work fostered in other people the idea that fossil missing links, including human precursors, were somewhere out there to be discovered if we would only look for them, Darwin himself seems to have been a bit dubious that such links would ever be found. Now, of course, it's well established that long before he published On the Origin of Species, Darwin was already fully aware that his theory firmly placed our species, Homo sapiens, as simply one more product of the evolutionary process. But without a human fossil record, the matter of human origins was not one that could be broached in anything but the most abstract of terms, and therefore the most harmless of uh, terms. Now, as I've said, at the time that Darwin published The Origin of Species, it's dubious that he could have made reference to the human re fossil record, even if he'd wanted to do that. But by 1871, the uh, situation had materially changed. So we still need to ask if there were reasons beyond the admittedly very powerful socio-political ones I've already talked about, why he more or less ignored the now available human fossil record in the descent of man. And one reason for this may be that his close colleague, Henry, uh, <coughs> Thomas Henry Huxley, had already ma tackled the matter head on in his 1863 book of essays, Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature. Now the last chapter in uh, Huxley's book was explicitly titled On Some Fossil Remains of Man. And it dealt specifically with the best preserved and the best documented uh, fossil humans that were known at the time. These specimens were the Neanderthal skull cap we've already seen a picture of, and the two partial crania from the site of Vengis in Belgium that had been public, uh, published by a guy called Philippe Charles Schmerling back in the 1830s. Now, by the time Huxley was writing about this material, the Angis fossils had been certified as contemporaneous with the extinct Ice Age woolly mammoth and the woolly rhinoceros. Uh, they'd been certified by, by, uh, as truly ancient by, by no less an authority than <coughs> the highly influential uh, geologist Charles Lyell, who was closely associated with uh, Darwin throughout his uh, career. And Lyell had also pr uh, pronounced the Neanderthal fossil to be of great but uncertain antiquity. Now, one of the Angis crania, the brain case that we see uh, in this slide here, had, belonged, had actually belonged to a, junior, uh, a, a juvenile uh, Neanderthal. But since this skull, being that of uh, an infant basically, had showed few of the features that we recognize in the adult, the Neanderthal affinities of this specimen remained unrecognized and, uh, and, and Huxley largely ignored it in his analysis. Instead, he based his <coughs> work on a cast of the other Angis cranium, which was adult. Now this individual clearly did belong to our species Homo sapiens, but it's turned out that it's actually a, a later burial into Neanderthal deposits at the site and was not contemporary with the extinct animals that were found there um, at all. Still, the fact that Huxley didn't actually know this may not actually in practice have mattered very much in light of his rather perfunctory and dismissive analysis of the specimen. Unsurprisingly, he recognized in the uh, adult Angis cranium uh, to, be, to be the cranium of a fully modern person, and he concluded no more than it had belonged to a person of limited intellectual faculties and a low degree of civilization. Uh, <coughs> he then proceeded to the Neanderthal skull, which was the other biggie at the time. And it was altogether a more interesting specimen, and he uh, devoted much more space to it. Now Huxley was clearly deeply impressed by the differences between the cranial contours 
of the Neanderthal and the Angis crania. However, he noted at the same time that uh, in certain features, the Neanderthal specimen showed points of similarity with certain Australian skulls. Now that's sort of code, because in the scientific and cultural mythology of 19th century Europe, the Australian Aborigines belonged, along with the Bushmen, to the lowest of, uh, of races. And by superimposing the profile of the Neanderthaler onto an Australian skull, as you see here, Huxley finally contrived to convince himself that a small additional amount of flattening and lengthening with a corresponding increase of the supraciliary ridge would convert the Australian brain case into a form identical with the aberrant Neanderthal fossil. So, whereas the Angie skull is a fair average human skull, which might have belonged to a philosopher or might have contained <laughs> the thoughtless brains uh, of a savage, the case of the Neanderthal skull is very different. Under whatever aspect, we meet with ape-like characters, stamping it as the most pithicoid of uh, human crania yet discovered pithecoid ape-like. However, at the same time, uh, Huxley knew that this skull cap, the Neanderthal skull cap, had contained a large brain, a brain that was actually bigger than the modern average. And further, although the preserved bones of the skeleton that we saw in that slide a few minutes ago were robustly, robustly built, Huxley felt that such stoutness was to be expected in savages. So he concluded that the Neanderthal bones cannot be regarded as the remains of a human being intermediate between men and apes. They are pithicoid, the extreme term of a series leading gradually to the highest and best developed of human crania. And if I had time, I'd be talking now about the great chain of being, you know, whereby <coughs> all forms of life were sort of uh, uh, in somehow connected in a single chain running from the lowest uh, to the highest. But anyway, by this intellectual sleight of hand, Huxley dismissed the Neanderthal find as a mere savage Homo sapiens, essentially robbing the slender human fossil record that existed at the time <coughs> of any potential human precursor. And none of this breathtakingly disingenuous reasoning had anything to do with the demonstrable morphology of the Neanderthal specimen. And indeed, the uh, Neanderthal was so <coughs> distinctive that in this very same year, the Dublin anatomist William King allocated this fossil to a distinct species of our genus, Homo neanderthalensis. Now, Huxley was a really, really good anatomist and, and paleontologist, and all this is extremely curious. And it was a, also a very strange reversal of perspective for somebody who had been a convinced saltationist. After all, when reviewing On the Origin of Species after it appeared in, 19, in 1859, Huxley had been uh, moved to observe that Mr. Darwin's position might have been even stronger if he had not embarrassed himself with the aphorism Natura non facit saltum. We believe that nature does make jumps now and again, and a recognition of that fact is of no small importance in disposing of many minor objections to the doctrine of transmutation. But famously combative though Huxley was, totally lacking in any of uh, Darwin's reluctance to hash out in public the implication of, uh, of evolution for human origins, Huxley too caved in when it came to the contemplation of the human fossil record. Um, he simply didn't judge these human fossils by the same standards that he applied to uh, the rest of the, the, the fossil record. Now, what Huxley's motives may have been for doing this is really kind of hard to tell. Though, as I say, had he been writing about any other mammal than a hominid, it's a dollar to a nickel he would have come to a different conclusion. And almost certainly, he would have discerned one of nature's jumps between the Neanderthal fossil and the avowedly higher uh, type from Angis. But by 
declaring that the Feldhofer fossil and the Anatol fossil was merely a brutish Homo sapiens, Huxley provided Darwin with exactly the excuse he needed not to broach the fossil evidence in uh, the descent of man. Darwin could safely ignore the crucial Neanderthal fossil because Huxley, in however non-Darwinian a spirit and however much in, in, in contradiction of his own previous principles, Huxley had given him license to do so. So to summarize, there were many possible reasons why Darwin should have been disposed to shrink from any substantive uh, discussion of the uh, human fossil record. <clears throat> the record was awash with fakes. Any discussion of it was rife with social and political pitfalls. Uh, the geological uh, to, uh, record, to his uh, mind, was uh, unreliable. And anyway, by his close colleague's testimony, that record contained nothing that could have any relevance to ancient and now extinct human precursors. Now, Darwin's position was, of course, a setback for the nascent science of, uh, of uh, paleoanthropology. Um, and uh, it, uh, it really was. But it doesn't mean that the largely theoretical descent of man has not been exceedingly influential. And indeed, I don't think it's <coughs> overstating it to say that it's mesmerized the science of human origins over the last 150 years. Just as it's very easy for English speakers to forget how much they owe to William Shakespeare in the language that they use from day to day, we tend to lose sight that much received wisdom in paleoanthropology has come down to us direct from Darwin. Darwin it was who proposed a mechanism for the structural continuity of human beings with the rest of the living world. And uh, Darwin it was who gave a detailed theoretical argument for human descent from an ape-like progenitor. It was Darwin who documented beyond all doubt that all living humans belong to a unitary species with a single origin, which we now know on the basis of uh, evidence of which Darwin could never have dreamed to have been only around 200,000 years ago. Darwin also had the inspired hunch that our species had originated in the continent of Africa. Again, another guess that was later amply substantiated by science. What's more, Darwin's perceptions on the behaviors of other primates and how they relate to the ways in which humans behave were remarkably astute, given the highly anecdotal nature of what was then known. So in this way, virtually every section in the first part of The Descent of Man foreshadows an area of anthropology that has, or biology, that has independently flowered since. And in the same way, almost literally, Darwin set the agenda that has been followed by paleoanthropology and primatology over the last century and a half. And I just wish I knew what he really had thought about the Neanderthal and Gibraltar fossils. This was a man with an opinion about everything, an intense curiosity about everything. And I bet he didn't think uh, that, uh, boy, those uh, old uh, human beings really look weird. Um, <laughs> he had a more informed opinion than that, but we'll never know what it is. Thank you. So Vian, if you want to join me over here. Sure. Uh, make oh. sure that your microphone is working. Okay, is it? <clears throat> I don't know. Oh, well, what should, what should we do with the, uh, the presentation? There you go. Thank you for a really interesting talk. This is a topic that rarely we actually hear about. I mean, I read both the origin of species and, and the mm -hmm. descent of man, and that was always one of the questions. Why know nothing about yeah. the fossil record? It's, uh, it's really strange. Uh, we're going to wait, of course, for people to uh, gather uh, <coughs> the cards about questions and answers. And um, I'll start by asking you an, an obvious question, perhaps, which is going to be broad enough that you can mm -hmm. just keep going with it, which is, OK, and where are we now? I mean, at the time, we only had Neanderthals, pretty much, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, now we have a much richer fossil record. I think it's the, the, the original uh, Lucy is still available for view here in, in uh, town. I think she may have uh, moved on. We have left. But uh, uh, yeah, she was, uh, Lucy was in uh, New York for six or eight months yeah. uh, last year, yeah. And what are we in, in, in that respect, in terms of the most ancient uh, part of the human fossil record? Ooh. Well, you know, paleoanthropologists uh, are in the habit of complaining very vociferously that they don't have enough fossils because <coughs> if they don't complain, nobody will give them any money to go out and look for more of them. <laughs> um, but in fact, by now we have a really very good human uh, fossil record. Um, uh, I mean, when I compare uh, what we have today with what we uh, had, even when I got into the field in uh, the early 1960s, uh, it's a totally different, uh, um, a totally different game. Uh, we have uh, hominid or plausibly hominid fossils all the way from, um, uh, from uh, about seven million years ago, right up to the present. We have um, ample evidence for huge diversity in the uh, human uh, fossil record. Uh, uh, my last count of species, I think, uh, that most people would, uh, would, uh, would um, uh, recognize is uh, 23 or 24. Um, species uh, documented, you know, and that's bound to be an underestimate uh, of the actual diversity that was out there. And what's become very plain, you know, wh when we had very few fossils, it was very tempting to, to sort of line them up right. um, over time and, 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 and draw lines between them. And, and we only have one species uh, of hominid in the world today, only one, one species in the, in, the, in the human family in the world today. And so we tend to, to, to think that we can sort of reconstruct our past by projecting that species back into the past as it becomes more and more primitive and eventually blends with ancestral apes. Um, clearly it wasn't like, like this at all. And uh, human evolution uh, has been a story of a lot of evolutionary experimentation. So what you're <coughs> saying is, um, I guess in some sense, not unusual um, even other groups of animals, that is, that there was a point in the past where there was a fairly large number of species of hominids, and then it's all at some point we got to a smaller and smaller number, and now one. Uh, is there any specific <coughs> idea that you favor about how that happened? Um, did we kill them all, in other words? Or well, that's, in a, in a, in a, in a word, yes. Um, <laughs> If I wish I had, I, I had my uh, chart of the, uh, the, the, the human family up on the computer uh, to, to show you. But if you look at the human family tree, you see that typically there were several different uh, species of hominid in the world at any one time in the past. <coughs> and uh, that was true, that was true uh, four to six million years ago, that was true three million years ago, that was true two million years ago. In fact, two million years ago, by the shores of Lake Turkana, there were at least four different kinds of hominids wandering around on the landscape. Um, and so you can be bet that in uh, Africa in general, there were many more species than that. So it's been typical for several hominid species to coexist throughout the, uh, the, the history of our family. And, um, Homo sapiens is alone, a unique, in being the own, only hominid in the world. And I think that tells us a lot about ourselves. And I'm going to jump into one of the questions. <coughs> Some of the people in the audience are getting technical already. Yeah, just grab the water while you're yes. doing that. Yes. And the question is, do you think that Homo floresiensis is a separate species? And if you can t tell us a little bit about for the rest of people mm. who don't know who Homo floresiensis actually is. Well, I think probably everybody has a vague idea of uh, Homo floresiensis, if only because it's got more, uh, more publicity, probably, uh, than, uh, than any uh, hominid fossil discovered in the last few years. Um, uh, several years ago now, um, I think 2004, uh, a, uh, a skeleton of a very tiny hominid with uh, a very unusual morphology and a very small brain was discovered on the island of Flores in the, um, in the uh, uh, Indonesian uh, archipelago. And it turned out uh, it, this was described as a new species, um, Homo floresiensis. 
And uh, the extraordinary thing about this new species was that its, its remains were dated between about 80,000 and 12,000 years ago. This incredibly archaic looking hominid, which you might have thought was, you know, back from three, four million years ago, was living on floras until about 12,000 years ago. Some people couldn't really uh, uh, be comfortable with this, and a lot of effort has been uh, put into explaining the strange morphology, the strange anatomy of this fossil as a pathological uh, expression, that here's a, an abnormal member of another um, uh, hominid species. But I think that uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the smart money has to be on it being a separate species. It is very distinctly uh, its own species. Uh, I can't see why we put it in the genus Homo. I think it's clearly a member of the family Hominidae, but I think it could, uh, could well use its own, you think it's that its own genus. It's that, it's that different. And if it's related to anything, I think it's related to probably the very, very first uh, immigrants who came out of Africa uh, about two million years ago. Before two million years ago, all hominid fossils are known from Africa. This was the, con the, 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 the continent in which the family was born and in which it lived uniquely for something like five million years. Um, after, just after about two million years ago, uh, there was an exodus of hominids into, into Asia. And um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this uh, strange, strange hominid on floors, God knows how it got there, uh, was actually uh, tied in to, to very early members of this exodus. Now, last year, the, there also was this flap about the publicity con concerning a pre-Lucy fossil that, that some people are arguing was not actually in the direct line of ancestry <coughs> of human beings. You, wanna, you care to comment about that? Well, there have been a lot of razzmatazz lately about uh, Ardipithecus, right. um, which is uh, bizarre. Uh, a bizarre uh, primate, if it's a hominid at all. It's a 4.4 million year old skeleton from uh, uh, northern, um, northern Ethiopia with a lot of very strange uh, characteristics. And I'm not 100% convinced that it's properly considered as an early uh, relative of, uh, of, of ourselves. Okay. Um, <coughs> another question which tends more to the, to the sort of general issue that from which Darwin Day is actually originated. Darwin mm -hmm. Day is originated in the middle of the 90s, by the mm -hmm. way, as far as I can tell, in several uh, colleges, more or less simultaneously, 95, 96, um, largely in response to, of course, the creation uh, mm -hmm. controversy. Thank you. <laughs> that shows um, initiative. And so one of the questions was, uh, according to Gallup poll, only about 15% of Americans believe that evolution happens mm -hmm. without any divine intervention. Um, I believe that this is because uh, of a lack of exposure in public schools to the idea of mm -hmm. evolution. Uh, this person went to Stuyvesant and to, does not remember uh, hearing any, mm -hmm. anything about it. Have you worked with high schools or does the museum work with high schools uh, to improve the biology curriculum? Yeah, the, uh, I, I work at the American Museum of Natural History and uh, uh, we certainly do work with high schools and we work with high school teachers particularly. And, um, there are many programs to which they come. There's a program in which I give a talk on human evolution um, uh, every summer where uh, 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 high school teachers are brought into residence and uh, spend a week, two weeks with us, uh, getting an intensive uh, grounding in evolutionary biology of all kinds. And uh, we hope that this will have some kind of effect. I'm of the school that thinks that, you know, religion and uh, and, um, and, and science are separate ways of knowing, are separate domains of knowledge, and that there's no necessary conflict uh, between them. The problem is that, that America is a very religious uh, society, in much in the way that England was in the middle 18, 18, 1850s, um, very much bound to, to, to scripture rather than to more metaphorical um, ways of, uh, of interpreting revelation. Mm -hmm. and uh, as long as you have a my story against yours uh, mindset, um, there is always going to be a conflict. Actually, you know, science, scientific knowledge is a moving target. It's always changing. It's a provisional set of knowledge. 
you know, and uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, you know, to, to criticize science for proving ideas wrong um, is uh, basically to misunderstand the whole nature of, uh, of the enterprise. So I don't see this kind of conflict, and most of the teachers that I get to, to, uh, to, to talk to don't have, uh, don't have that kind of problem either. I think the teachers that we get obviously are a sort of a self-selected group who are likely to want to listen to what we're uh, to what we're saying, and there are plenty of teachers out there who um, don't really know what we're saying, and, and probably because of that, uh, find it uh, difficult to uh, to to work in with their own their own beliefs. When uh, when you mentioned um, the provisional status of um, of scientific discoveries, I always find. That one of the interesting uh, objections that are raised by creationists is uh, you, eventually if you start talking to creationists you will get to hear of course the term Piltdown Men mm -hmm. as, which is a famous forgery um, yeah. of, of a allegedly pre-human you know, ancestor but, and, and they point this out as an embarrassment somehow to science and biology and so on and so forth and my response to that is actually that's a great example of how science works Exactly. Because the, the Piltdown Man was discovered, it was initially accepted because it did fit uh, the expectations of the time. Um, mm -hmm. that the forger, whoever it was, knew that, and that's how he designed it. But then the more evidence came out, the more the Piltdown Man stood aside mm -hmm. as something completely odd until people went back and figured yeah. out it's a fake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most people think that it's only in 1953 or, or that, that, that uh, Piltdown was sort of exposed as a fake by modern, uh, well, by chemical. Uh, chemical analysis, as, as a matter of fact. But for 20, 30 years before that, people had sort of factored it out of their, um, of, of, of their uh, thought process about human evolution. That brings me to the next question, however, which is sort of another one of these broad things, but um, w it would be the kind of thing that a creationist would also ask, not, necess not that I'm implying that the person who wrote this is a creationist. Uh, what is our best evidence for evolution of evolutionary theory? So if you just had you know, a, a two-minute response to pick one or two mm -hmm. things that you say, well, these are really convincing. This mm -hmm. is really convincing stuff. I think the best, uh, the best reason for, uh, for um, believing that, that evolution is a mechanism that actually does prevail in nature is the way in which life is organized into groups within groups within groups. Uh, you know, long before the notion of evolution, um, uh, came along, scientists were already classifying uh, the, uh, the nature around them in recognition of this, uh, this structure, groups within groups within groups. And the only mechanism that predicts that pattern in nature is uh, common ancestry. It's the only, it's, it's the only scientific notion that, that predicts what we actually find in nature. And to me that's compelling. Um, the next two, I'm picking two questions which are somewhat related. One, and, and they both actually are closer to your, um, to your expertise and your interests. Uh, one of them deals with you know, it, the, the old question of what do we know what happened to the Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is the sort of uh, colored of that, which is do, what do we learn, if anything, about human cognition by comparing the fossil record and particular Neanderthals and, and sapiens, if anything? Yeah, the fossil record uh, and cognition is, is very difficult because uh, basically what you have in the fossil record that relates to cognition is brain size and brain shape. And this doesn't correlate, uh, it doesn't map onto what we know of what makes our cognition different. The best way of uh, going about this actually is to use proxies from the archaeological record, which is the the material record of human behavior rather than of, uh, of, of human anatomy. And looking at the, uh, at the proxies that we have, all of which are, are, are somewhat arguable, we find that our symbolic way of processing information about the world probably did not, was not acquired until anatomical Homo sapiens was already on the scene. It's an incredibly, incredibly recent um, acquisition. Building, of course, on a very long history that preceded it. But we're the only creature in the world <coughs> that basically lives in, in the world that we create in our heads by decomposing 
the environment around us into a mass of mental symbols that we can combine and recombine to create alternative hypotheses about the world. Every other creature seems to more or less live in nature as in, in the world as nature presents it to them. They may respond in more or less sophisticated ways, but basically they're living in a world that's specified to them. And we remake the world in our heads. And there's very little um, evidence of this symbolic sensibility in the archaeological record until surprisingly recently, less than 100,000 years. The next question may be a little controversial in terms of, or getting us into discussion of some controversies within evolutionary biology, mm -hmm. which I think is good um, because the public needs to learn that there, the evolutionary biology, just like any other science, you know, physics, astronomy, or whatever, is, mm -hmm. is <coughs> evolving. There, there's things going on. We don't all agree on, on, uh, on what's going on. So the question is, uh, biologist David Sloan Wilson um, mm -hmm. makes the point that educated liberal university faculty, especially in the humanities and social sciences, uh, show the most uh, muddled and fearful thinking about human evolution. How do we biology faculty talk about to our colleagues who, feed evolution, who think that evolution stopped when uh, culture started? So that this idea that there is a, a, a drastic divide between biological and cultural evolution. Um, what do you think? Is, do you think there is such a drastic divide? Do you think the biologists and <coughs> anthropologists should be talking more to the other guys on the humanities side um, about these things and educating them a little bit? Well, I think there's certainly a lot of feedback uh, between uh, culture <coughs> and, uh, and biology in, um, in, in, in human evolution. And, you know, your, your, your behavior and what you can do with your uh, behavior is, a, uh, is an expression of uh, whatever biological endowment that you have. So there's definitely an interrelationship in, uh, in, in hominids, especially uh, you know, hominids, uh, the, uh, the family to which we belong, are incredibly complex uh, on a behavioral level. They have highly complex societies, and there's definitely been a feedback between um, the, the success of, uh, of, uh, of particular hominid species, uh, you know, which uh, we, we, we measure by their biology, and, uh, and, and the behaviors they were able to make. So there is a, there is a feedback um, there. On the other hand, the processes of, um, of behavioral, uh, of, of, of cultural evolution and biological evolution are very different. Biological evolution, uh, you know, goes down through the generations. And uh, culture can spread not only down through the generations, but sideways in a society. So it can happen much, much more quickly. And, um, but I think uh, the, the ultimate patterns that the two things produce are probably fairly similar. Which brings me actually to ask you a related question about what's your take on evolutionary psychology? The idea that uh, at some particular point in the, in the not so recent past of the human lineage, mostly it seemed to be the place to see, uh, human beings evolved by natural selection uh, specific behavioral modules that mm -hmm. are still affecting us today. Yeah, I, I basically don't like, uh, don't like this. I mean, I see, I see I'll this buy a drink later. Hmm? <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just mentioned that, in fact, our unique mode of cognition seems to be very, very, very recent. And I think that the addition of this symbolic capacity that we have to the historical uh, uh, legacy that, that our ancestors uh, possessed has produced something totally unique and something that wasn't predictable from earlier trends. So um, clearly, uh, you know, our, our, what we are depends on what we were in the past. And we couldn't have become what we are today in the absence of any of the innovations that added up in the end to make us uh, what we are. But I don't think it, uh, that all specifies to 100% what we are. I think when we added, when we added uh, our symbolic uh, thought processes to the intuitive uh, kind of intelligence that we had before, that our predecessors had, you got something entirely new. And that it is so different and so qualitatively different that um, whatever was going on back uh, any time before 100,000 or 50,000 years ago is relatively irrelevant. 
So at some point during your talk, you, you mentioned the great scale of being when you were, when yeah. you were talking about um, <coughs> actually. So one of the questions is well, why, why do we talk about the, the descent of man as opposed to the ascent of man? The ascent of man. Oh, that's a very Why are we so much better than everybody else, <laughs> in other words? <laughs> <coughs> well, you know, the people have written books called The Ascent of Man. They're mm -hmm. just not as uh, famous as uh, the... Uh, <laughs> the title the, didn't catch the, on. The Ascent of Man, yeah, right. <laughs> but what, what do you think about uh, this idea of, uh, more generally, I guess, more broadly, of uh, progress in evolution? Is there, such a, is there a, meaning, uh, a, a meaningful way in which evolutionary biologists can talk about progress during evolutionary... Progress is a very uh, value-laden uh, yeah. is a very value-laden term, which is why uh, most of us would rather rather avoid it because what you think is progress is not necessarily what I think is progress. And but we can say we can definitely specify that change has occurred. We can look at the uh, at the uh, um, extinct uh, forerunners of human beings and say yes, we have changed. There is something different about us. Um, whether we consider it progress or not, I don't know. We have this extraordinary way of processing information which has allowed us to basically dominate uh, the, uh, the face of the earth. And uh, whether you think that's a good or a bad thing, whether it's progress or not, is, is very much up to you. I thought that progress meant being closer and closer to an old white man. <laughs> Just my impression. Uh, the next question also actually picks up on something that you uh, mentioned briefly, uh, the, the sort of the controversy to some extent between Darwin and, and Huxley about mm -hmm. gradual versus <coughs> saltational evolution. And mm -hmm. Of course, the question in particular is concerned with the work of, of Stephen Jay Gould and actually of your colleague at the American <coughs> Museum of Natural History, Niles, mm -hmm. uh, Niles Eldridge. Um, could you talk briefly about what your opinion is about the, the is there an actual difference? Um, what is the current consensus in the paleontological community and that sort of thing? Absolutely. It's, uh, we're, we're at a very, very interesting time in evolutionary biology now because I think that basically for my lifetime, uh, population genetics has been a dead weight on understanding uh, the evolution, the, 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 the interaction between process and pattern uh, that we pick up in evolution. But molecular biology is helping us to understand the actual mechanisms involved. Evolution isn't about simply uh, gradual changes in gene frequencies that we can model easily if we're smart enough um, over the eons. Uh, we know from, uh, from now from molecular processes that the genome is an incredibly complex um, uh, entity, an integrated entity, and all kind of things can go on in it, and all kind of things can't. They're limited, they're constrained by the uh, structure of the uh, mechanism itself. And I think we're learning that uh, very often there is a, now an identifiable mechanism, mechanism that the molecular people um, uh, can identify in those jumps, in those saltational events um, in, the, in, the, in the fossil record. We know that the fossil record doesn't show a gradual, gradual, gradual change from from ancestor to descendant in all, in all lineages. There are those jumps. Huxley was absolutely right that, uh, that there are jumps, and now we know why those jumps occur. Um. Hmm? <laughs> why do they occur? Gene, uh, because of uh, gene regulation. <laughs> you can find major, major, major developmental consequences of small structural changes. Right. That's just a little bit of a change in the timing and the expression of, 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 of a gene yeah. make a huge, huge anatomical difference. To, to follow up a little bit, of that actually is, is one of, of my area of, of research. And it turns out that there is very good both empirical evidence and mathematical modeling that shows that depending on the, on the nonlinear structure of gen gene regulatory networks, <coughs> uh, it's actually fairly easy to show how small changes in DNA of particular genes can cause cascade of effects that show up as fairly large uh, changes at, at the level of the phenotype, that is, at the level of, of uh, the way things look or behave. So this is actually now well understood, um, both in theoretical terms, I mean, we have mathematical models that show under what conditions that sort of thing happen. And, uh, and uh, as, as Ian said, at the molecular level, we now actually have pretty good evidence for it. So, so it's no longer a paleontological, uh, paleontological thing. If you want to ask questions, by the way, we do have 
where are our, Michael, where are you? Yeah, there's somebody over there. Uh, the author which of which book? Which book? Oh, uh, did you mention a book about gene regulation? No. I missed it, no. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so let me move on to the next question, which is, uh, this is a broad one, so you can go anywhere you <coughs> want with this one. Uh, but what are, what, what are the uh, forefront, cutting edge areas in human paleontology at the moment? What, what are we doing? Well, there's a lot of um, our fronts that we're uh, understanding fossils on that we couldn't before. Things like uh, stable isotope studies, which will allow you to, uh, to uh, reconstruct uh, the diet of ancient uh, creatures, for example, with much, much more um, uh, accuracy than was uh, you know, previously um, available. Um, there are... I've always been, been a great advocate of, uh, of sort of using one eyes, one's eyes when uh, looking, looking at, at, at fossils. But now there are ways, there are sophisticated mathematical ways of visualizing and comparing uh, fossils <coughs> that seem to produce uh, results that are, um, that are much more um, satisfying to reductionist human minds. Uh, than uh, simply saying, yes, th this, this looks like this and this doesn't look like that. And so we're able to quantify differences uh, that we find in the fossil record are much, much better than we used to be able to. Uh, there, are, there are methods of dating now that allow us to, to uh, date fossils that were previously I think your mic is going back and is off. Mic? Yeah, it's going oh. back off and on. Yeah, that's yeah, nice that's work. It should be. All right. That should be working. Yeah. 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 So chemistry has uh, has added a lot to uh, to what we are uh, we are able to say, and uh, and uh, geochronology has improved vastly, and uh, biomechanical modeling is so much better than it used to be. But there's a lot of hot areas that are being uh, being explored currently. The next question, actually, the next couple of questions that I picked up, going back to points that we have already mm -hmm. sort of talked about, but I, I think that uh, it's, c it's going to be interesting to get into a little more um, depth into this. The first one is, do you think that, um, quote unquote, anti-religious heavyweights like Richard Dawkins mm -hmm. are doing any good? I, I think the, uh, the, the, the opposing religion is, um, in the name of science, is really self-defeating. I think it is much better and more constructive and easier to communicate to people. Uh, that uh, these are complementary ways of, uh, of knowing. And, uh, you know, I just wrote a book. It um, uh, uh, just, just came out uh, about la last month, I think it was, for the Templeton Foundation, oh. you know? And um, they are very, very anxious to try to, to reconcile um, science and... Um, That's the whole idea. Right? And, the, the uh, and really just, uh, yeah. Exactly, and um, they're very thoughtful. They're very thoughtful people, and they have a, now they have a science a series of sort of pocket-sized books on, on major areas of science. And I just wrote one of them uh, f you know, on uh, on paleontology, on, on on the history of life, and um, you know, thinking about all of this, it really it really occurred to me that there really is a there is, a, there is a single trajectory here that's all founded on the fact that we have a absolutely inexhaustible thirst for knowledge about ourselves, about the world around us, and about our, about our place in that world. And you can sort of, you can, you can look upon the trajectory of knowledge, if you want, as a, sort of like a, like a two-stage rocket. You know, science deals with the material world. It doesn't deal with the intangibles. It doesn't deal with ultimate causes that we can't uh, propose falsifiable hypotheses about. And I think it's a very nice metaphor to, uh, to imagine you're uh, on a two-stage rocket and you take, you ride the scientific first stage to the point at which science can tell you no more. And if you still have questions, if you still have questions, you have to explore them. Uh, through uh, through uh, the, uh, religion, philosophy, and uh, and and those those other areas that don't have those same inherent limitations on what you can do that science does. I'm glad you mentioned <coughs> philosophy uh, because as as a philosopher, I would 
ask you, however, you know, hearing what you, s what you just said, um, what do people mean by religious knowledge? I mean, knowledge, uh, presumably, in philosophy knowledge is defined often as justified through belief, mm -hmm. meaning that you believe in something, you think that you know something because you have reasons to know mm -hmm. it, to, to, to hold that belief, and, and you have reason to think that, those, those reason, that that belief is in fact true. Mm -hmm. It seems lot hard to apply that to any kind of religious notion. Well, there is a knowledge of faith, you know, and I, it's hard for you to apply it. It's hard for me to apply it. I don't have much of it myself, but plenty of people do. Plenty of people do. Pen plenty of people have strong inner convictions, and that is another form of knowledge. And I think it's an okay kind of knowledge uh, to to have, just so long as you s keep your 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 knowledge grounded in what is testable about the real world. As long as it's built on top of your knowledge of the tangible world, um, I think it's fine because there are questions that you can broach, questions of ultimate causation that we can pose about the, uh, in, in terms of the observable world um, at, at the moment. So yeah, it's a different kind of religious knowledge, a different kind of knowledge, but if you're looking for you know, your place in the universe, you're not going to find it in science because you can't pose that kind of question in scientific terms. The only place you're going to find it is in a, in, 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 in a context uh, the revolving around uh, faith. Or science is about doubt, right? <laughs> science is about doubt, that's for, yeah. sh that, that's for sure. Um, let me move to a different topic, again, that we have had sort of covered a little bit earlier. Uh, this is the question of multi-level selection or mm -hmm. group selection, although group selection is only one aspect of, of multi-level selection. The, the, the question is this. Um, can you talk about a little bit about multi-level multi selection and how that affects uh, cultural factors and therefore the interaction between, between biological evolution and cultural evolution? Well, I imagine by multi-level selection you're referring to sort of hierarchical uh, levels at which selection may take place. Right. Um, you know, I'm a great fan of, of Darwin, but I'm not such a great fan of, um, of uh, natural selection, for, ex for example. Um, natural selection seems like, uh, you know, a, sort of a mathematical uh, certainty until you realize that, that natural selection is the reproductive success or failure of, uh, of individuals. And um, we, when, we th when we think of, of evolution, we think more about the evolution of uh, the foot or the brain or the gut than we do usually about the evolution of the taxa in which those individuals are, 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 are uh, embedded. Um, natural selection can only vote up and down on the success of the whole individual, which is an incredibly complex uh, integrated um, genetic whole. Um, and I think probably most, uh, you know, most of the time it's, it's, it's okay to be, uh, uh, to be good enough. And it's whether your species is doing well or not that may be just as important, if not more important, for, uh, for the ultimate pattern that, that a future paleontologist will see in the evolutionary record uh, than uh, whether you're doing well as an individual. Um, or not. So I think multi-level selection is very important. I wouldn't deny the importance of uh, natural selection in, you know, as especially in, in regard to, to, to uh, body systems that are very closely related to reproduction. Um, but I think, you know, how species are doing compared to their competitors in the environment are fine. It doesn't do you any good to be the most wonderfully adapted exemplar of your species if that whole species is being out-competed into <coughs> distinction, extinction by another one. You know, being the best in Neanderthal didn't help much um, when Homo sapiens um, uh, came along. So yeah, those higher level, uh, that higher level triage to me is really, really important. Um, thank you. Is it possible that the public, <coughs> public widespread skepticism or even denial of human evolution uh, derives from the perception that science of, has, has failed to solve crucial problems facing humanity. I would actually broaden this question and say, you know, mm. what about general skepticism about science? Yeah. It's not just human evolution. It's mm -hmm. global warming, it's vaccines, yeah. and all sorts of other things. 
No, I mean, that's, that is a very, very good question because uh, science has very often been its own worst enemy. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, it, 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 it poses as being authoritative. What science is about is, is about proving bad ideas wrong and not proving good ideas right. We have no real way to prove an idea, an, an idea right. But we like to, to, we like to pose as a sort of the guardians of, uh, of clinical objectivity. And that raises expectations beyond what science can deliver. I think science very often promises more than it can actually deliver by the very limitations that make science a different way of knowing. And uh, that is not a good thing, and that, that tends to, 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 to lead to disappointment sometimes. I have the impression, I mean, I, I'd like to, to know what you think about this, I have the impression that part of, that, that problem has ex been exacerbated in recent years uh, for the same reasons that have exacerbated debate on all sorts of issues, including mm -hmm. political ones in, in our society, which is <coughs> there is a tendency now even among scientists to, for instance, go straight for a press release to send out to, uh, you know, to uh, radio mm -hmm. television stations rather than going to you know, Nature magazine first mm. and publish, and which, in other words, to bypass the, the peer review process or to yep. announce discoveries pretty much in simultane uh, simultaneously mm -hmm. with the peer review process. Yeah. There's this pressure that has been mounting about being there first, and that may you know, backfire, it seems. Yeah in terms of credibility. Yeah, no, science is very competitive and it, I think it leads to, 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 to uh, um, promulgating really more than, uh, than, than it can really deliver, which again it leads to dissatisfaction and, uh, and, and disappointment. You should be very careful what you promise that you're, uh, you're producing as a, as, as a scientist. Um, I think it should be enough that science has actually pr produced <coughs> a body of uh, information about the world that has allowed our lives to be incredibly, uh, you know, orders of magnitude uh, more comfortable and longer than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than, than, than they used to be. And that was mostly done without make, making excessive uh, promises or politicizing things by, by uh, trying to get money via your congressman from Congress rather than making a competitive application to, to NSF. There's a lot of this. And as science becomes more expensive to do, I, I suspect we'll find, we'll find uh, more of this. And we have to be aware, beware of raised expectations, of excessively raised expectations. Speaking of politicizing science, uh, there's another question which I can't find at the moment, uh, which brought up the, the topic of social Darwinism. The, mm. the question was in the context of asking whether Darwin was ever a social Darwinist. But I think uh, it, it'd be <coughs> nice to talk about it actually a little more in general because mm -hmm. there's a history of eugenics right here in New York. Oh, I, I found out recently for research that I was doing for a book, uh, documents from the Long Island uh, Eugenic Society mm -hmm. advocating in the 1920s and 30s castration of mentally inferior mm -hmm. people and so on and so forth. So, and that sounds like it's not, first of all, it's not that ancient history. It's only about less than a century ago. But mm -hmm. there's also a moment now uh, for instance, about uh, you know genetically engineered using genetic engineering mm -hmm. to improve human beings, that mm, it's poised to raise similar questions in terms of what we do with this yeah. kind of science. What's your take on on the whole idea of, of you know, social Darwinism and how it, it affects public's perception of evolution? Well, social Darwinism, uh, I mean, I, I <coughs> got completely got completely out of hand and and totally um, I discredited. You know, by the events uh, leading up to and surrounding uh, the, the Second World War. Um, you know, Ernst Haeckel, that the, uh, the, the German paleontologist who's, uh, or developmental bio biologist who's, who's, um, who's, who's phylogeny of, of mankind, um, uh, I, I showed, sort of took uh, <coughs> a social, uh, social Darwinism and ran with it and ultimately uh, after a very long developmental process, was became the inspiration of the Nazi Party um, in the years uh, before uh, World World War II. Um, so uh, there is, you know, there there is a uh, the the big problem is that Homo sapiens is is the species that takes good ideas to crazy extremes. <laughs> nothing nothing can remain as just a good idea. Uh, we, we have to take it and go too far with it and, 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 and um, caricature it. And, um, 
any any good idea can be can, can, can be taken too far. Uh, if you read Fra what Francis Galton uh, was uh, trying to do, the, the really the father of uh, of, 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 of of eugenics, um, who was Darwin's cousin, who was Darwin's cousin, um, actually was trying to decrease the sum total of misery in in the world, and he was advocating eugenics and not dysgenics. Okay, there's a two kind of eugenics. You can promote good genes, and you can uh, you can get rid of the bad ones. And it was the notion of dysgenics that really led to 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 the hideous excesses uh, that we saw in this country uh, before and after uh, World War uh, World War Two. Um, I, 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 would, I would rather see uh, Darwinism uh, kept entirely out of, of the social realm because we have other meal, means of dealing with uh, social problems. We don't, have to, we don't have to involve biology in, um, in, in, in the solution of, of social problems because it can be so easily uh, abused and has actually very little, I think, positively to contribute. So speaking of isms, why, why, do you, why do we still talk about Darwinism after all this time? After all, you know, physicists don't talk about Newtonianism anymore. <laughs> why, no. why do we use that term? <clears throat> uh, it's, 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 uh, it's interesting. We don't all talk about uh, Darwinism um, a lot, but it's the, uh, the neo um, the, the neo Darwinists are basically the standard bearers of, um, of Darwinism, and that's just one take. On, uh, on Darwin. The thing about, you, you read the origin of, of, of species and there's, there's, there's a huge amount of material in this. And this man was so curious about so many different things. One of the big themes in his, in his book was about divergence. How do, how do lineages, how do species uh, diverge from each other? That's been completely sort of lost in the, um, in, in the, uh, the neo-Darwinian paradigm. But it was a very big concern of, of Darwinism. I think the, 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 the term Darwinism is very easily hijacked. And uh, in a way that Darwin himself, I think, would have hated. Yes, like there's <coughs> many people who are more Marxist than Marx. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to yeah. be more Darwinians than Darwin. Yeah. Uh, the next question is about connecting Darwin's ideas to previous ideas about evolution. Because after mm -hmm. all, the idea of evolution had been around for a long time, in fact, even from the ancient Greeks to some extent. Yeah. But how, how does, what was Darwin's novel contribution to compare to the, the earlier versions of the, of the idea? Well, I think there are, two, there are really two aspects to it. First of all, he, uh, he was such a, on the one hand, a, a straight down the, uh, the line advocate and, and uh, characterized the basic descent with modification idea. Um, you know, so clearly uh, that it couldn't be ignored. Uh, but the other thing was that he had, uh, he had a mechanism. And the thing is that natural selection, you think about it, that's why Huxley berated himself, saying, why didn't I think of that? It seems, it seems, it seems a mathematical certainty. You know, you have more, more individuals born in any generation than survive to reproduce. There is some triage. Some individuals do better than others. These, their features are hereditary. And so it's a sort of a, almost a mathematical certainty that, uh, that um, natural uh, selection is, uh, is, is going to occur. Um, and I think it was very ironic that pretty soon after, after the initial furore over the uh, uh, the origin of species died down, pretty much everybody was accepting the descent with modification no notion as the, as the explanation, the obvious explanation for the way the world is organized if you look around at it. Um, but the big, the big argument was over natural selection. And in fact, that, that argument wasn't really solved for another, uh, for another what? Uh, 80 years before the, uh, no, it was 60 years before uh, the, the synthesis right. um, came along in the late 1920s and 1930s and 19, uh, 1940s. Um, and, you know, I, uh, clearly natural selection is, uh, is, is a factor in evolution, but I think it's a much smaller factor than it's been given, uh, given credit for. So to confound Darwinism and natural selection is kind of a shame. 
In fact, um, it's interesting when, whenever, again, I'm confronted by creationists who, who talk about Darwinian orthodoxy, which is a great made-up term. Um, mm. They say, well, it's, you, know, you guys all think the same. It's a sort of a group think. Uh, uh, there's <coughs> never been any alternative theory of evolution that's been taken seriously um, by scientists. And that's not true, actually, as you, as you pointed out. Darwinism, in the original sense of the term, went through a period of eclipse for several decades, mm -hmm. during which, as you said, the, the, the idea of common descent was accepted, but that one, natural selection, certainly not. There were several alternative theories that have been proposed, including some neo-Lamarckian versions mm -hmm. of, of evolution. It's just that eventually what you referred to earlier as the modern synthesis, which is the current uh, paradigm in evolutionary biology, which emerged in the 1930s and 40s, that's the one that happened to have won the, mm -hmm. the, the debate up until now, I think, actually. Yeah. Uh, new things are ca happening uh, right now. Yeah, right we're moving point. beyond the census now, right. thank God. The next question is, uh, um, what about the, Af the, the out-of-Africa theory? Um, is there any doubt about it anymore? There's very little doubt about the, uh, the, the, the birth of the human species in Africa. There's something extraordinary about the African continent because <coughs> the, the human family evolved there. And after five million years, hominids got out of Africa for uh, the first time. And that would be around two million years. Then there was another exodus at around, of a different species uh, at around 600,000 years or thereabouts. And there was a whole succession of, of births of species and exoduses um, out, of, out of Africa. So it's, it's, it's a, a process that's repeated itself over and over and over again. And we've had local terminal species uh, of hominids developing in far-flung parts of the world, Eastern Asia, Europe, and, and, and so on. But only Africa has pumped out new kinds of hominids into the world that have then taken over the world. And so the out-of-Africa theory, which is, uh, basically deals with, um, with the origin of Homo sapiens, is uh, uh, just the latest in, uh, in a series of pulses out of Africa. And the evidence for that is pretty good. We have the earliest um, fossils uh, that, that look like, just like us in Africa. They start turning up around uh, 200,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, they, don't, they don't show up outside Africa for another 100,000 100, 100, years. Um, and then we have the first intimations of modern behavior, which is more recent than the acquisition of modern anatomy. Uh, in Africa, in the period uh, a little less uh, uh, than about uh, 100,000 years ago. And again, uh, there appears to be, have been then an exodus of fully symbolic uh, modern humans um, uh, following the, the initial archaic um, of anatomically modern humans um, in, um, uh, uh, out of phase with the... Uh, um, so what, what you have is, is, is a fossil record and an archaeological record that suggests origins in Africa and exoduses from Africa. And then you have the molecular uh, information comparing populations of modern humans uh, from around the world that shows that this, the molecular tree that we have of relationships among all modern human populations is rooted in Africa. So was this part of a general pattern that, in, that involved also other non-hominid species, or was this a, just a hominid uh, phenomenon? There aren't that many other species that, uh, that, 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 that have this particular history. Um, uh, this is true uh, uh, at earlier times. At earlier times, uh, it's a little, bit, a little bit different. But for the, for the origin of, of Homo sapiens, is not part, as far as I can tell, of any significant faunal turnover and certainly the origin. The origin of, um, of, of modern uh, behaving Homo sapiens may have been related to climatic stresses that are well documented in Africa, which may well have reduced the entire population of Homo sapiens to uh, um, uh, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 um, individuals um, at one point. Uh, the subject of race, which you mentioned briefly mm -hmm. uh, with one of the slides uh, referring to, to Huxley's um, <coughs> book. Uh, what is the status of the concept of race in modern biology or modern paleoanthropology? Well, you know, race is a sort of a failed concept of species. If something looks a bit different and you can't determine that it's a different species, you call it a race. 
But uh, you can, the big problem in, with, uh, with, with human races is that although you can look around the world and you, know, you can uh, you know, guess with reasonable accuracy where uh, a certain percentage of the people in the world uh, have their um, ancestry or the greatest part of their ancestry, you can take any populations and, 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 and define their boundaries. And I think what happened is that uh, you have a history of a, an origination in Africa, um, a spread of, uh, of that species uh, living in very low uh, concentrations and scattered over huge parts of the Earth's surface in which differentiation between local populations took place. So that, you know, you have a, a, a recognizable sort of African, European, Asian style of, uh, of appearance. Um, but you can't really, uh, you, you, you can't define their boundaries because for at least the last 10,000 years and possibly more, the history of the, the human species has been, has been reintegration. There's been rampant interbreeding between, uh, between different populations because we're all part of the same species. And those, 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 um, uh, those distinctive characteristics that were acquired in over a very short time, they're very epiphenomenal um, in isolation, are now being, uh, being, being blended together again and will ultimately be lost. So you, you think know, that subspecies uh, or races, whatever you want to call them, they're all ephemera. So you think that the future uh, of the human race is to become a race, one race, as in well blend into one big pot? Well, essentially, uh, what we have now is uh, six to seven billion people, you know, living packed cheek to jowl um, over the uh, over, over the face the of the earth, and there's, there's, there's two consequences of this. One is more interbreeding between uh, people from different parts of the world. Everybody that has their DNA done gets a huge shock. You know, uh, I, I never had any idea. You know, I had I had ancestors from here, there, and everywhere. People have been moving around for a very, very long time. And the second thing is, we've got this huge gene pool, which is probably impossible to uh, to move in any particular uh, direction, which we have such a, a huge breeding population uh, that we can't, uh, we, we can't rely on, on, uh, on evolution to, to run in and save us from our folly. You know, we're going to have to live with ourselves the way we are. Speaking of uh, uh, evolution going somewhere, this is going to be the last question. And it is broad. Is evolution going anywhere? Is there any direction? Oh. Is there any point to it? Did it ever go anywhere? Mm -hmm. You know, yes, everything is, is, is retrospective. You know, this is, this is the nature of uh, any, any historical phenomenon like this. You know, it seems sort of uh, inevitable in retrospect, but at any one point in time, it could have gone in any of uh, multiple different, uh, different directions. And I don't think that in our species that the conditions for, uh, for any significant change uh, exist. Short of some hideous, all too easy to imagine disaster that might fragment the population again, um, there's, there's no way we're going to fix uh, significant new genetic variants into our population now. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you, Ian Tattersall and Massimo Piucci. That's fantastic. Thank you. Okay, here a hand for him one more time. Yeah.